This is the Limitless Faith, His Will, My Desire podcast show episode number four. Our show is about inspiring, encouraging, and impacting the apostolic community to embrace the calling of God and showing the world that the best life is living for Jesus through the power of testimony. You don't want to miss out on your blessings, so be sure to follow us and subscribe. Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Javier Hinnad Jr., host of the podcast show, and today's special guest is Brother Georgian Padigo, who is an evangelist, who's going to be sharing a powerful testimony in which we'll be reflecting the importance of being sensitive to God's will in your life. So please stick around to the end, you don't want to miss it, and make sure to smash that like button, make sure to follow us and subscribe so you can stay up to date with the latest episodes, and we also ask that you share some feedback. Leave us a comment. We'd love to know what we can do better or what you'd love to see on the show. So let's get ready and let's jump right into it. Uh, just to jump on in, Brother George and Pettigo, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. It's super, super excited to jump into your story and, um, you know, to start off with your testimony. So are you ready to, to jump on in? Absolutely. Whatever you got, I'm ready to go. So. so let's, um, you know, before we, we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to pray. I'd like to uh, really, because uh, I, I fully believe each and every testimony and story that's going to be shared on the show is going to be a blessing for someone out there that listens to it and that can relate to anything that you've gone through and anything that you're doing today, right? That they aspire to the, to do that. Um, so to, to be able to to kind of sow a seed, to kind of bring some encouragement. I want to be able to pray that any open heart out there that's going to listen um, can feel inspired and encouraged to, hey, God's got this. God's got my back. Just like he's been helping Brother Georgian, Brother Javier, and so many on the show, he's got me as well. So um, would, would you be okay to lead the prayer? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and take a moment. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come together today. We know that this virtual world is a new thing for us as the body of Christ, but it's allowing us to take new steps and new strides into the body of Christ and to reach out in ways we've never been able to reach out before. So at the beginning of this, we just want to thank you for the opportunity and ask for your guidance through the Holy Ghost. Guide us into what you need us to talk about today. If there's someone listening to this who needs some encouragement in your name, Lord God, touch us, speak through us, Lord God, encourage us, let us gain wisdom from each other, Lord Jesus, but guide our steps, guide our thoughts, guide our minds. We're in this for your glory, Lord Jesus. So touch us. Let us get to know you better and help us. The body of Christ, you said iron sharpeneth iron, Lord God. So let us all help to sharpen each other in our minds, in our spirits. Let's all lift each other up. So touch us in this podcast. Help us, anoint us, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, we love you and we Amen. praise your name. Amen. Yes, Jesus name. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for leading prayer. Um, all right, let's jump right into it. So um, where I want to start off is, you know, let's let's jump right into the beginning of it all, because a lot of people may that are listening uh, or let's say would look up to see what you're doing today. They may not know all the steps that you took to get where you are today, right? What happened behind the scenes and um, the different experiences. So let me start off by asking, you know, when, when was it that you gave your life to Christ? When you opened up your heart uh, to accept and did you, did you grow up in the church? Was there a, a moment in time that uh, you came to find out about the Lord later on? H how did that happen? Uh, I was blessed to be raised in the church. My family was in ministry. My dad was our um, assistant pastor at my church. My grandfather was my pastor. And so I was blessed to grow up on the pew. Uh, and then kind of, obviously you have that, you're coming to coming of age moments where, you know, the gospel becomes yours, not just for your family. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say to answer that simply, I, I grew up in the church. That's awesome. Right. Awesome. Awesome. So growing up in the church, um, and, and being what, you know, growing up for me, and I'm sure for you, hearing the term PK, right, a pet pastor's kid, um, you know, you got to really experience firsthand, uh, and still today, right, seeing, um, you know, what it is to be in, in that ministry life, right? Absolutely, yeah. 
that was life, you know? So it was every day you came home from school. And I think like for most PKs, I mean, at least this was for me, like, I never thought about it that way. You know, like everyone mm-hmm. talks about being a PK, but I never thought about being a PK. This was just life, you know? Right. I never really thought about like, oh, I'm a preacher's kid. Mm-hmm. It was, this was just, this is what dad did. It's what grandpa did. This is what we did with our lives. You know, we were at the church a lot and we, we were at a, different events a lot, a lot of weddings, a lot of funerals. We, we uh, did a lot of uh, different events. But I never saw it when I, I can honestly say like when I was really young growing up, it, it took a long time for me to realize what being in a ministry setting and being in a ministry, because that was just life. It's how I right. grew up, it's how we function. So I didn't really realize what was going on until I was a lot older. And I was like, oh, like this is different from a lot of the ways that people, you know, have their lives and set up and everything. Uh, but it was a blessing. I, 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 I can't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Would you, so... When would you say at what age um, did you embrace and starting to think about and ask those questions about God's calling? And, and you know, you're seeing so much of the ministry being in a household um, in which you're growing up of, of ministers. For you yourself independently, wh- when would you say that you said, hey, you know, at this age, I started really thinking about God's calling or, or really my relationship with the Lord? At what age would you say that started? I would have to say that, I mean, obviously, you know, when you grow up in an app stock Pentecostal setting, most of the rallies you're going to go to, most of the events you're going to go to will have, you know, you have camps. Mm -hmm. Um, We have Sunday schools. We have kids revivals. So you're always aware, right? Right. Always aware that there's a deeper step to taking to get to God. And uh, I, I received the Holy Ghost when I was eight years old at a Bible quizzing rally. And I think that was the first time and I'll never forget the sermon was because it was all about, they were talking about the armor of God and they were talking about, you know, like having the shield of faith, you know, the, the guard you against the fiery darts, of the devil. And I, for whatever reason, I was terrified of not being protected. Right. Uh, right. Of not being ready to fight against the devil. And that's the night I got the Holy ghost. Cause I wanted to be ready. You know, I that's didn't awesome. I'll walk around, not ready to be able to combat that. And, but I think, you're always aware when you're in that setting, when you grow up in a church setting, you know that there's something about God that's out here, but it takes a while. Like even at eight years old, like I received the Holy Ghost when I was eight years old, but I have to say, you always have like little moments where you think about what you want to be, you know, mm-hmm. what, what do mm-hmm. I want to be when I grow up? Um, but when I started taking God seriously, it was probably, you know, obviously when you get into the youth group, so 12, between 12 and, uh, and then obviously it's, I think like, like most people, when you start getting through high school and then all of a sudden you grow up and you're moving through and you're starting to figure out like, okay, like what do I want to do with the trajectory of your life? Mm-hmm. Then you start really thinking about calling. The rest of it is just trying to like figure out how to be a teenager and uh, you know, a Christian teenager. So I think a lot of that, you know, your initial like knowing God and there's supposed to be some kind of relationship. Yeah. They're around the, eight between eight and 12 and then from 12 to 18 you really start like trying to nail down like okay like i know he's out there and now i'm supposed to have a relationship with him what does he want me to do right right Uh, it's that big question right what's my purpose what what where where do you want me to go exactly and so so you got the holy ghost at the age of eight which is awesome awesome and 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 i think it's always a moment that i tell people when you go through that experience never forget the day did happen, right? Never forget that precious moment. That's a memorable moment. Uh, and one of the best memorable moments that you're ever going to uh, have in your life. So now you're, you're growing up. Um, as you're getting older now, you're starting to ask those questions that you were just mentioning. Um, what, what was, you know, what did you want to do initially as you were growing up? You know, what were some of those thoughts going uh, through your head at that time about uh, and your relationship and your walk with God about your purpose, you know, or, or career wise, what, what was kind of going through your mindset at that time? Yeah, that wasn't, that was an interesting thing. Um, because I think there is a fine line when you are a preacher's kid. Um, there's a fine line because everyone kind of expects you just to jump into the ministry and everyone just kind of expects you to fill the role that your parents filled. And I think that's a lot of pressure on kids, 
not only that, but they've got pressure from multiple different sources, right? You know, now, and I, I, don't, I mean what I'm about to say very respectfully, so I'm not, I'm not coming after anybody. This is not, I'm talking about culture, you know. Right, like, right. I don't know, culture, like, there's a lot of pressure for young kids now. So every time we come to a camp and every time we come to youth events, by the end of the sermon, there's always the question, well, how many feel called to be a pastor? How many feel called to be a missionary? How many feel called to be an evangelist? And you're going to have like 98% of kids walk up to the front. Well, most of that is peer pressure, right? Like they're walking up front because no one wants to be the guy who says, I don't want to do anything for God. Well, I think for me growing up, I, I always got uncomfortable in those situations because I knew what ministry was. I watched my dad do it every day. I watched my grandfather do it every day. I knew what ministry entailed. And it wasn't like, I, I guess, kind of the, uh, you saw the reality of it. You didn't see the right. fairy book, like, or whatever right. of ministry. Like, you knew exactly what it was. So I'm like, okay, like, I'm not going to say yes, like, that's what I'm going to be called to unless I'm actually called to it because I'm not going to do it just because dad did it. I'm not going to do it just because grandpa did it. That's not my game. Right, so, right. I'm not going to, you know, and I had a hard time as a kid because I felt like God wanted to be a part of my life and I wanted to be a part of his plan and his will. But I just wanted to make sure like, look, I'm well aware that that does not have to be behind the pulpit. And so when I was getting, um, you know, when I was getting closer in high school and stuff, I wasn't going to be a preacher. I wasn't going to be a full-time minister. I may help the church, but I, I, what I wanted to do was, I was going to be a communications major when I went to college and I was going to focus on, you know, film making, uh, editing mm -hmm. and, uh, commercial art, like doing logos and art for companies and stuff like that. Um, and that was what I wanted to focus on because I wanted to make sure, um, I, I went, I think I went into it thinking like, I'm not going to make that full commitment to ministry unless I absolutely feel like right. that's what I need to do. Right. Because, like there was a sense of respect of this isn't a game, right? I'm not going to do it because yeah. everyone else is doing it. I'm, I, I need to make sure God's placed a piece on me that this is his will. Yeah. And I think there's obviously like when you're young, you get a chip on your shoulder. Like you don't want to mm -hmm. do it just because, you know, you know, there's, there's a little bit of that too. It's, it's probably a little bit of pride that God has to work out of you when he's you know, really called you to something. But I think it's one of those deals where I'm not going to do this just because dad and grandpa did it, you know? And uh, or like if your family's super involved, like, no, I want to be my own person. I want to be my own man. I want to do my own thing. Um, and so there's a little bit of that too. But also I, I really believe there was a respect there. I, I just knew like, I'm not going to do this. It's not right to do this. It's not fair to people to do this if I'm not called to it. Right. Um, because then you're not going to be able to really put your whole life into it because you really weren't called. And uh, I don't mean that as a bad way. Because I feel like anyone who wants to help out ministry-wise, I'm not trying to discourage that either. Right. Just, I guess that point I'm trying to make there is, like I said, just God's ministry is not relegated just to a pulpit. You know, you can minister to other people in, no matter what job you're on, you know. Absolutely. Be the best apostolic doctor you can be. If you're a lawyer, you can be the best apostolic lawyer you can be. If you're a plumber, you can be the best apostolic plumber you can be. And you can still minister to people in those areas, you know. That's what I'm saying. I, I just didn't right. know full time ministry was really what I was called to. So, and I, I think, you know, we were talking about this the other day, right? Um, I think some of the mindset that our young people have when they're going to uh, take up the calling of God and they don't know what it really is having that ministry life their feet aren't on the ground, right? Like the way you're, you're describing it, your feet was on the ground, right? You, you were, you were focused. You understood that if you were to commit and make that decision, uh, you understood what you were telling God at that point. Right. But I think others, um, they have a, have a view of it in which they think it may just only be preaching behind the pulpit when it's not. And, and you're absolutely true, Right. Uh, you can be a lawyer and 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 win souls. I mean, be a soul winner. Uh, you can be a plumber. You can be an engineer. Whatever you want to do for a career, continue to go preach the word because it's not only preached behind uh, a platform or pulpit. And uh, I think the way I was looking at it was um, with Instagram and Facebook, people see the highlights of people's days and it looks great. 
but really there's a lot of different moments behind the scenes in someone's life and and that's what we don't see and i think the same manner young people look at ministry and they see how amazing a preacher preaches but there's a lot more to that that's why yeah. like 10 20 percent yeah like 90 percent of what being a minister is is not on the pulpit like you're right you're on the pulpit you're behind the pulpit for maybe like 10 percent of your life you know what i'm saying yeah. like what Let's talk about like a normal week here. You know, you have a midweek service. Most people have a midweek service. And then you, some people have one service on Sunday. Some people have two. So we're talking about maybe two to three times a week. And that's not counting other Bible studies and stuff we teach. But I'm talking about like strictly like behind a pulpit. You know, what we would describe as preaching what, behind the pulpit, what, like what we would envision. That, what, let's, out of all the hours in the week, you're maybe like four hours tops behind the pulpit. I mean, unless you've got multiple different church plants and stuff like that. I'm talking about the general. Right. Right. Behind the pulpit, what, like maybe four hours a week. Uh, and what are you doing the rest of that week? Well, you're doing everything else that ministry entails. You're going to hospitals. You're going to, uh, you're, you're going to birthday parties. You're going to schools to visit kids. You're going to uh, funerals. You're taking care of the church finances. You're taking care of this. You're taking care of that. I mean, there's so many other things that you, the, you're teaching Bible studies, you're, you're running out meeting people, you know, there's so much other, and that's just, if you're a full-time minister, let's not forget it, that like, right. That's not most people are by vocation, which means they have a secular job. Plus they're, you know, pastoring a church too, which takes a giant leap of not only faith, but commitment level because they gotta, they gotta have a foot in both worlds. Right. So, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for you, you know, you were, you were explaining as you were in high school and you were uh, coming to that moment, deciding what your next steps are, right? Now you're, your senior year, really, let's jump to, you know, you're graduating and now it's time for college, right? Now it's time to, to take that next step forward, the next chapter. Uh, what happened? What, did you end up going into the major of communications? Um, you know, what were those next steps? No, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was going to, I had made up my mind that I was, I was going to go to secular school. And I, now let me put it this way. I was going to go to secular school, but I was still going to go to Indiana Bible college as like a part-time deal. Mm -hmm. Just kind of get my, uh, my feet under me because I, I, like I keep, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to say this multiple times just because, you know, being a man of God does not necessarily mean that you're behind the pulpit right so god didn't call us all to a pulpit ministry but he did call all of us to be children of god which means you minister right. in every aspect so in that mindset when i was about to go to school i was thinking like okay like i still want a foundation so i'll go to I'll like dual dual credit i'll go to ibc just to get my foundational doctrine so that i can survive on a college campus and uh have the right mindset in whatever career path I go out, you know, I still want to work for God. I want to do things for God. Right. Um, and I, then I'm going to go to secular school for communications. And it came down to a point where it was, and I'm going to admit something and people are probably going to be like, whoa. Uh, but like I got down to the end of my senior year, my parents are like, Hey, you know, if you really want to go to college, you're probably going to have to take your SATs, right? And I uh, I don't know why, but there's something in me that was avoiding it. And uh, even like putting apps out for colleges, there was something about me like I was, uh, and naturally I was like avoiding it. I don't know why, like that's what I wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. You'd think if that's really what you wanted to do, you'd be jumped at the chance to like try to get into the school you want to get into and all that type of stuff. And I was just like avoiding it and I don't know why. And it came down, I'll never forget, I was in my parents' room, I was sitting in a chair and they were asking me, they said, hey, look, uh, you know, you're a senior in high school now, so you're going to have to figure out what you're doing here. You're going to have to figure out how this is moving. Uh, and they said, so you're going to have to make some decisions here pretty soon. And I'll never forget, I just broke down and I started wow. sobbing because that was the first moment I realized, like, no, I know I'm called to ministry and I've kind of been running from it because I've had a chip on my shoulder Right. And I'm trying to be so careful, not doing it for the wrong reasons. But it really hit me in that point. And I told my mom and dad, they were saying, like, why? And I said, because I felt like any time I was doing anything worthwhile or the only time I felt like I was helping people or doing anything that was of worth was mm -hmm. not when I was making videos. It wasn't when I was really doing art. Those things were nice. I enjoyed them. They were hobbies. Right. right. I never felt fulfilled in my life doing that. Like, can, can I do that? literally for the rest of my life. And it hit me the only time I felt like I was making that 
that choice and that fulfilling choice to, to work for people was when I was operating in a ministry role. And so I decided to go to full-time IBC. And so just to, before we jump into that following chapter now, that moment when you broke down, that moment when you just opened up completely and you just accepted what you were feeling from God, I mean, what were the thoughts really running through your mind at that moment? Because that, that is a big, big moment. And for anyone out there that, that is listening and that is struggling with God's calling over their life or maybe scared, right? Because I know that some people don't, don't accept it because they're afraid of failure, right? And, and you and I have spoken about how, you know, God doesn't call the qualified, right? He just wants willing heart and willing hands. And, and listen, he's going to do the rest. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd say what was going through my mind was, uh, first of all, I was just terrified. You know, you're this about mm-hmm. your future, right? And you're, you, you want to make the right choice. You want to make the right decision. But I knew what I was feeling and the thought that, like I just said, the thought that just kept running through my head was, you know, the only times right. that you've ever felt like you were making a difference was A, when you were speaking with people and you were doing some type of formal speaking, which... In my mind, I was still trying to struggle with calling that preaching, but it was like right. when you were speaking in front of people, you felt like you were making a difference. And when I was either doing helping lead worship or singing, and it was operating in ministry fashions, they were like, that's when you feel the most fulfilled. It feels like when you're making a difference, you know? Right. And uh, so I, I was really holding on to that, saying, like, okay, like that gives you more fulfillment. You feel like you're doing something that matters when you're doing that, not when you're doing art. Do you feel like you're doing something? Because you're going to be passionate about what you're called to, right? Right. So a doctor, like, I don't know, I keep throwing this out, but I'm, I'm, th- I'm just kind of painting the broad strokes. Whatever, mm-hmm. this is going to be a doctor. Like, not doctors aren't the only who are passionate about their craft. I'm talking about anything. Yeah. Like, be a carpenter and passionate about your craft, but that's what you're passionate about, right? That's what you, that's what you do. And some people get a job, and that's just their job, but, like, usually you can tell like, no, this is the career. Like when you're thinking about college, like, no, this is what I, I want to do. This is what I'm passionate about. This is where I want to go. And I realized that that's where that was, that feeling of fulfillment was there. And I think the reason I broke down was because I'd been really fighting it for a long time. Cause you know, when I was a kid, I had like a hundred different things I wanted to be. You know, I like grew up and I was like, I want to be a paleontologist. I want to be an archaeologist. I, I want to find all the dinosaurs. And I was a, a complete nerd. And, you know, and then I realized that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, it took me like a week. And, uh, and then I was like, oh, no, I want to be an astronaut. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, it was like a little kid. You're always changing your career choice. But like every little hobby or little thing I was interested in, that's what I wanted to do. But it was weird. I always had this little thing in the back of my head. Like I told my mom, I was like, oh, I want to be an astronaut. And she always teased me. She said, but then you'd say, well, I guess if I was an astronaut, I would have to be a preacher too. Because, you know, even the aliens need to be saved. And all that right, type right. of stuff. You know, it was just like, yeah, there was always this thing in the back of my mind. I knew God had that for me but I just couldn't admit it because I was scared I would do it for the wrong reasons. Uh And it was until I had that moment where I realized the reason you want to do this is not because of dad is not because of your grandfather. It's because this is where God is using you. This is where you feel like you're being used for his kingdom. And that's kind of what helped me make that decision. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome, man. And, and, you know, for everyone out there that's listening, you know, we, Right. That, that, this is the goal of the show. Right. We, we want to encourage every single person out there um, to embrace that calling. But of course, right, we, we understand that everyone has their own journey, right, their own story with the Lord. But that this story, right, your story today, Georgian, can can reach everyone out there and just say, you know, it's it's really on your own terms and your own time with the Lord. But once you accept that and you, you start to allow him to show you all the great things that he can do, no matter how small you think you are, no matter how little impact you think you can make, where, wherever he leads you, you can make that difference. And, and of course, right, this is what you're talking about, right, Jordan, that no matter the career that you choose and the passion you choose, you're still a preacher at the end of the day. You're still a Christian. You're still called to be a child of God. You're still called to win souls. And and, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind when we started talking was uh, Andrew, Peter's brother. I don't know if, if 
you know, if you remember, you know, a couple different times, the scriptures would show every time for the most part, Andrew would come see the Lord, he would bring a friend. And I thought about that. I'm like, that's really what we're supposed to be doing, right? We're still making an impact. Now, the Bible doesn't talk much about Andrew. It doesn't, you know, we, we hear, we see more about Peter and Paul and, uh, but, but not much of Andrew. And, but when you do read about Andrew, it's, you know, he's bringing, he's bringing a friend, right? So we always have to continue to be sharing the gospel and making that impact. Um, yeah. So that's awesome, man. I, I'm so, you know, it's so awesome to hear um, your own personal story, how God dealt with you and, and um, how you made that choice. So, you know, today you're, you're here in the Northeast, right? You're originally from Indianapolis, yeah. Indiana, correct? And you were born in Indianapolis? Born in, born and raised in Indianapolis. And, and so now, now you're here in the Northeast. So tell us, I mean, you, you went through IBC, um, now, now fast forwarding, it's 2020, you're here in the Northeast. What happened? How, how'd you get here? <laughs> wow. That is, uh, uh, that's a question. Um, <laughs> especially when you throw in 2020, because I feel like 2020 is like, is the blender you can throw everything into. And after that, it's like, it's a great excuse for everything. Right. It's, okay, well, life made sense, and then 2020 happened. And then you're just like, oh, wow, like, what really did happen? And so I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think about, like, how did I, how did I get here? And then you've got to say 2020 happened. And um, I will say I graduated Indiana Bible College, and uh, I think you obviously, you have that moment where you think you're going to get, like, hired, like, right out of the gate, and you think you're, you know, you're going to really be ready to go, like, take off. And God right. used it as a place of waiting. So I, I waited in Indianapolis uh, for a long time and just did what I could. Mm-hmm. Helped out on the youth team, uh, helped out on the worship teams, preached out when I could. You know, it wasn't huge or anything. And then um, we were just waiting and kind of figured. But I knew I wasn't called to stay in Indianapolis. I've always had that feeling. Mm-hmm. I knew I was called to go somewhere else. And, uh, man, back in, I want to say, was it March? No, it couldn't have been March. It was, it was, I think it was maybe closer to like beginning of May. I can't remember. It's April, May. One of these brother, Pastor Petoskey of the Pentecostals of Greater Hartford called my dad and asked if it was okay for him to approach me about coming to help him in an administrative role uh, in his district work is winter fire stuff. Um, and then also I'll be evangelizing here uh, in the Northeast and everywhere, honestly, evangelizing three uh, weekends out of every month, but then also helping him in some kind of just his administrative duties Mm-hmm. And I'm treating it as I'm also in school right now, uh, going for a graduate degree. And so mine is. Oh, in, awesome. Uh, Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, it's actually, um, my goal is to, uh, is, is kind of geared towards organizational leadership. And so the, we're treating this as kind of a, a internship, a graduate yep. internship, because I'm helping him in a lot of his administrative roles and how these mm-hmm. you know, the winter fire conference and how that works. So I'm learning a lot. Um, but it's also, it's kind of a, a dual purpose. I'm here to help and do what I can and preach right. out and, um, and uh, be developed as God sees fit in that area. And as well as help me develop for this, uh, this degree. So, but that's yeah. what I'm doing. That's how and I ended up in uh, Hartford. So that's awesome. And I just want to take a moment and kind of talk a little about uh, what you're, what you're uh, getting your graduate degree in. So organizational leadership, um, just the topic of leadership, uh, how important is that to really develop, you know, and, and how essential it is to, to focus on um, being able to allow God to, um, to kind of guide you in that. So can you talk a little bit about us, that topic of leadership and the, and the importance of it and developing uh, skill sets uh, when you work with other people? Yeah, um, I think, Far as, and listen, I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out there for everybody. I'm learning a lot. Okay. So I'm not like the guru uh, on leadership. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been blessed to be able to serve in some leadership roles through, I mean, throughout my life. Um, yeah. Obviously very, I'm young. So uh, I'm, like I said, I just want to throw that disclaimer out there for anybody. I'm not here to be the guru on leadership for everybody. I'm still learning a lot, but I, I've had some experience in leadership roles all throughout life, the high school, college, even in the church and uh, you know, just been serving like that. Not because I've been close to leadership, been able to examine leadership from a very close perspective. And uh, that's why it's so important in my life because 
I think you can, there are going to be those who have a natural tendency to lead. Like you got the personality for it and you naturally uh, have influence with people. And then you have those who is not their natural tendency and who God calls into the uh, ministry anyway, or God calls not even ministry, just leadership roles anyway, right. regardless of yeah, that might be your natural tendency or it may not be your natural tendency. So let me put it this way. Just because you might have a natural tendency or you may not have a natural tendency, doesn't matter because none of us are the leader that God wants us to be yet. Mm, whether amen. you got a natural tendency or whether you don't have a natural tendency, none of us are who God wants us to be as a leader yet. Mm -hmm. and that's a constant process. That is something you've got to nail down and whittle down every single day. You got to be ready to learn. You got to be like, and look, just because, like, as I'll say, like, I, I'm an extrovert. I love people. I love to be around people. And I, I, uh, I like to inspire. I like to be inspired. So therefore I like to kind of teach. I like to be inspired. So I, I probably personally, if we'll just stick on it very strictly, like, look, I'm not here to like, like boast or whatever. That's not what this is about. I'm saying like, if we're looking at this strictly logically right? in my life, I would have been set up like naturally, like, Oh, I would like, I would fit in one of those types of roles. Right. So that's why I'm saying this. It doesn't matter whether you like, okay. So what I'm learning now is just because my personality type might fit there does not mean I'm ready to go. It does not mean I'm ready to like jump in that spot and go perfect. I'm well aware that God's working on me. I'm well aware that God is shaping me every day to be the leader he needs because when you realize, I think we put such a high price on leadership because we've started ascribing position to leadership. And that's not what leadership is. Leadership is a position of service. Right. It is, it is not a title. It's not a job. It's not a, uh, not becoming a CEO. It is becoming right. a servant first and foremost. That's great stuff right there. That is all. Uh, keep going, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I just, uh, that's how I feel about it. So I have to realize every day that just because you might have a natural tendency or just because you may not have a natural tendency, if you're introverted and you, you struggle um, jumping into those types of social situations to kind of take precedent and if God's calling you to uh, leadership, uh, don't get discouraged. Like if you feel like that's what I'm not naturally called to, you know, neither was Moses. Like that's not, it wasn't his deal. He didn't feel called to it either. And there's multiple accounts in scripture where the people, I think you mentioned it earlier, uh, Brother Javier, where it's like he, he calls the unqualified. Right. Well, let me just say, I don't care what your personality type is. We're all unqualified for leadership. Yeah, we're absolutely. All, we're all human beings. We're all born into sin. We're all, we've all got flesh. We've all got things. We all got pride. And it's a, it's a daily thing where God is whittling that out and saying, no, I'm, I'm pressing here because you got some stuff in you that you're still not ready to go. So that's why I think leadership is so important because even though, let's say that I, I may have been able to serve or been blessed to be able to work in some of those circles before, I know that the training I need to accomplish what I need needs to be whittled down. It needs to be shaped. It needs to be uh, worked on. It needs to be hammered out and, 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 and fired and, and, and tested over and over and over again in order to make sure that there's so much less of me that more of him can actually bleed through the leadership. Amen. Uh, Amen. I, I, and not to cut you off here, cause I want to no. keep talking about this for, for the next couple of minutes. Cause this is, this is great stuff right here. You, I d bro, go ahead and keep preaching about it because this is, this is something that uh, I think is essential. Cause I started reading a book called extreme ownership by Jocko Willink. I don't, have you ever heard of um, Jocko? No. So he's, he's a former, um, I don't know if he's still giving service in terms of military time, but former U.S. Navy uh, SEAL and, and commander and, and in his book just started it. So in the beginning, he, he's kind of shared a couple different examples of as a, as a commander out there, actual war and specifically in Ramadi, Iraq, um, the different units, uh, the different amount of people that he had to watch over and and the missions they had to do, you know, it didn't always go as planned. And this is actually going to segue into the next question that I, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, in those moments of failure, he ta he's talking about the, how, how important it is as a leader, because most often what happens is when something doesn't go well, it doesn't go right. Leaders happen to look for what happened, 
you know, what, what, were the, what were those mistakes? And then blame. And they don't take ownership. And mm -hmm. so he talks about how he came to realize as a commander and being in the situation, how essential was to really look at the whole picture and say, you know what? If I'd done this, if I would have done this, I would have done that. Really, the blame falls on me as a leader. Even if I didn't physically make that mistake and others did, I'm responsible as a leader, right? So, yeah. so my question to you is, you know, what, what are some of those dangers, you know, once you're in a leadership role that could, that could really uh, fall um, it, as, as a challenge to face? Uh, and in this situation, I was mentioning how most often leaders blame others instead of taking ownership. So it seems like an ego thing, right? So what, what are some of those dangers you would say or you've seen when you're in a leadership role that one has to really be careful and has to continually pray for? Um. I think what you just said there, the, the ego thing, that's the hardest thing to deal with because it's so natural, right? You don't have to try to be egotistical. Everyone naturally thinks about themselves. That's, that's human nature. We are all the main character in our own story, right? Like when you wake up every day, yeah. you don't ever think like, hmm, I wonder how I'm going to help so-and-so finish his whatever today. Or It's like, you know, like you got main characters in books, you have, mm -hmm. you have protagonists, you have antagonists, and then you got these side characters who are there to add information, add a good uh, body to a story, add good uh, different information to different sources from you can pull to enrich a story, but not only that, help the protagonist find his way through his journey, right? Well, none of us ever wake up every day with the mindset of like, oh, I am the protagonist's friend. Let me figure out where my role is and, uh, uh, how I'm supposed to help. The pro well, guess what? As a leader, you're the protagonist's friend, right? You're not the main character because what are you called to do? You're called to serve, right? Mm -hmm. You're called to help others. You're called to lead others to their intended purpose, to uh, get further their purpose in God, especially like I would say in a ministry standpoint, it's really trying to take yourself out of that spot of like, well, I am the main character of the story. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, I, I'm here to help others, right? I'm here to be that side character in their life and help them achieve what God wants them to achieve. And that's a, that's a fight every day because, like I said, we're all human. We are naturally built to think about ourselves. Self-preservation. Right, right. It's like one of right. the strongest human instincts. We're all looking for the, our own success. So taking a back seat, and not only that, you want to be successful, you want to prepare. It's not saying you put your own success in the back seat, but in order to be successful, Mm -hmm. you serve others. There's a quote and I should have, I didn't know this is where we were going to go. I should have had it. Um, maybe I can Google it here really quick. This, yeah, go ahead, man. Go Google it. Google it. This is we terrible. I hate to do this, but it's worth it. I think because there's a uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he's one of my favorite uh, essayists, American essayist. I'm just going to write this down. What, what was that name? Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't want to take too much time doing this. <clears throat> no, man. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ralph. This, I will say, even when I was in high school, this is the quote that absolutely like broke my life. Now, obviously, you got to be careful with um, Emerson uh, because he's a he's. They call him the father of transcendentalism. So he kind of believed that eventually he started off. I think had some Christian values, but eventually he kind of. Uh, started doing the human spirit above all, you know, like, Oh, know, I see. You know. Yep. Yep. So, but anyway, he had some good essays and some good quotes about life. His observations on life are very powerful. It's like anything you read, you, uh, you, you eat the meat and you spit out the bones, right? You got to be careful. You keep, that's why you have to have a foundation. But uh -huh. so this is what I found this in a store one time. I just happened to, and this is what really started flipping my perspective. And it says, what is success is to laugh often and much to win the respect of the intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate the beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, well, whether by a healthy child or a garden patch or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. That's awesome. That line right there 
to know that one breath, like someone's has, someone has breathed easier just because I lived, just because I helped. I was just a small part in making their life. Even like, I, I love comedy. I love making people laugh. And I remember when I was in high school, that was, I made little funny videos and did little things. And my goal was, listen, you could be having a terrible day, but if I could interrupt your terrible day with 30 seconds of peace, with something to make you laugh, 30 seconds to something that'll inspire you, knowing that one life Mm -hmm. has breathed easier just because you have lived, that's to have succeeded. Yeah. That's leadership. Knowing that your actions and God working, not your actions, but God's actions through you, you being submissive and, and being willing to stop thinking about yourself for like five minutes and really just say, you know, God, how am I supposed to help person A, person B, get where they need to go. That's, that's leadership. That's amen. That's real success. That's, that's some good stuff. We can, we can, ladies and gentlemen, we can talk about this all day, all day. I think leadership is such an important topic to talk about. And, and, um, I just to add one more comment to this, and I'd like to hear, you know, your input on this, brother George and I at IBC, I remember brother Kilman had mentioned when it came to, uh, leadership to a certain degree. Um, one of, one of the dangers that, not well i maybe they are talking about it now i don't know so i won't i won't say they're not but um i personally haven't heard it too often is 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 power you know how how do how you use that authority that power and um and how some leaders use it in the wrong manner right It, it gets to them it gets to their head um because you you've pretty much hammered on that nail uh connecting leadership to serving and i i think that's as simple as it gets right there leadership equals serving um so what what would your input be you know do you do you would you agree to that statement do you think powers is something that could be dangerous if if you're not consistently uh seeking the lord having the lord to continue to to work on you what what do you what would be your input on that yeah well i mean absolute power corrupts absolutely yeah quote a hundred times and it's usually you know, talked about political uh issues and everything but no like power anywhere mm-hmm. correct absolutely so unless you have a basis in god where he's constantly reminding you, like hey hey who's really working here like who's really responsible for your actions right like, who's giving you these opportunities to serve right i didn't give you an opportunity to rule he gave us an opportunity to serve and i think that's where that mind shift i was talking about yes that power is very dangerous because there comes the temptation to use it for yourself yet Uh again, your ego. So yeah, to to be in a position of power, if that's what we want to call it, that's, that's right. There is the first, if you, if you are chasing a position, if you're chasing something like that, you're looking for power. You're not looking for a position of service. Right. That's not leadership. That is uh, that's greed. Yes. With a position of service, there may be power that God provide you with an authority under his authority to work that's his authority it's not your authority you're working in the operation of the authority of the holy ghost and god right mm-hmm. that's where you have to begin unless you have that basis you gotta start drawing those lines really quickly uh i love this line dan fogelberg wrote a song about his father called the leader of the band he's a musician this is a purely just random resource so just take it whatever but i remember if you look, there's a line in there. It's so powerful. And he's talking about his father. Uh-huh. He says he earned his love through discipline, a thundering velvet hand. And he's talking about that father. And if you start to look at that line, how it, it, he's really speaking about how his father leads. He earned his right. love through discipline, a thundering velvet hand. But a thundering velvet hand means he could lay down the law when he needed to, but he did so with kindness. He did so with wisdom. He did so. I with, love it good things a thundering velvet hand mean he was strong he had that foundation he had right. that foundation but it was always in kindness it was always for the betterment of the person he was disciplining it was always for the be- the better of the person so i think a position of power is not just for you to go in there and start smacking people around and knocking heads around it's a thundering if you could look at it as it's a thundering velvet hand let god's power through you be that thundering velvet hand where he may call you to deal with the situation he may call you to lead but that power has to be used in kindness and meekness and understanding. Now you take stands against evil. That's not, you know, you battle against evil. You battle against the wrong things. You take a stand when it matters. But when you're leading people and working with people that 
concept of being a thundering velvet hand. It's like you're you are the channel through which God is is using to serve, right? Right. So there's a power and authority under His anointing, under His Spirit. But that thundering velvet hand, where you're doing that with kindness, you're doing that with love, you're working on people, you're you're trying to help them, you're serving right. them. That's right. what I think is the balance of power there. It's really God's. It's not yours. That's awesome. That that is great great information man i appreciate you sharing that and uh you know to go into the next segment i what i want to ask is you know for anyone out there everyone listening every open heart um that is struggling you know struggling with god's calling in their life um and their journey and their walk with the lord what's some advice you'd give them you know to to um to take the right steps in order to get closer to God, we just, yeah. are we talking, we're not talking about leadership standard. We're just talking about getting close to God. Yeah. Right? To embrace his calling, you know, to embrace his yeah. calling. Cause I do think, uh, the leadership talk topic that we were discussing is really a part of our Christian life. Cause I think we are all called, uh, to lead right now. That doesn't literally mean like you were mentioning, right. Just making uh, an exclamation point on that. Uh, doesn't mean, you know, once you get a title CEO, right. Everything that you were mentioning, that's that's exactly what I would agree with. Where, you know, as a Christian, as a child of God, we're we're called to lead. We're called to preach. We're called to lead. We're called to make a difference. So, you know, for someone that's struggling with God's calling, um, what's some advice that you would help them in their journey or to embrace that calling? Um, I would say check your check your uh, motive. Mm-hmm. Check your motive, because I think that's where I've had to learn a lot. Because even, you know, good intentions are not always God's intentions. So you might be about to do something with good intentions, right? It's not evil. It's not sinful. You're doing something really trying to do good. But good intentions are not always God's intentions. So when I say check your motives, if you're struggling trying to figure out where God's calling you, check your motives. The actions that you're about to take, the actions that you're wanting to take, whose motives are actually guiding those actions Are they your motives or the God's motives? Are they what you want or is what God's pulling you towards? And I think that's where that balance has to come in. If you're struggling with that and you know, that's number one, check your motives. Yeah. Because it's going to help you point one. That's just going to help you start making some decisions. It's kind of like, okay, like this is not necessarily, you know, the Bible says not all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. It's like, Amen. Yep. just because it's not a sin, just because it's not bad. Just be, it, it, it's, in fact, it's good. It has a good outcome. If I were to do this, like just because it's good, doesn't mean it's God. So really start to start basing your decisions off of that. And then I would just say, like, look, if you feel like God is tugging on your heart to do something, then, then do it. Like, don't worry about your, your qualification level. Don't worry about your, um, your leadership ability, like I said, we're all unqual- we're all unqualified to be leaders. It's only through God that we're strengthened to be a leader. Yes, it doesn't matter. your background doesn't matter. What degree you hold doesn't matter. What piece of paper you got hanging on your wall uh, that matters very little to God. Now, yeah. God, my dad always told me every day, you know, God can only use you to the degree that you prepare yourself. Meaning, you learn as much as you can, you be inspired as much as you can, you strengthen your mind, and you prepare. You study to show yourself approved, right? Because God Amen. can only use you to the degree that you prepare yourself. But at the end of the day, you're still human, and He's still God, and it's going to be His power that gets the job done. Yes. So look, if you feel like God is calling you to something, you feel like it doesn't matter what it is. It, it doesn't have to be pulpit ministry. Like I'm saying, it doesn't matter what God's calling you. If you feel like you're being pulled in a direction, wake up every day and say, okay, God, how do I accomplish that the right way? Lead me, guide me, give me wisdom. You know, wisdom is a gift freely given. If you ask God for wisdom, he will give you wisdom. So. Good. That's awesome. That's great. And, and I think, you know, just to, just to hammer on top of that really is just to, for everyone that's listening, willing hands and willing hearts, that's all he's looking for. That's all it's looking for, right? That's the same willing hearts and willing hands that the people of Israel had when they built the tabernacle. In that same manner, that's all he's wanting from us. And we're going to, you would see, for everyone that's here, you would see how God can be glorified. And for you, in your eyes, the smallest, whether it be biggest, whatever the scenario may be, for him to show you his power. Uh, that's great advice. I appreciate you sharing with that. Uh, so what I want to do next here, Brother Georgian, to jump into the next segment, and, and we're, we're coming to a conclusion. It's, it's called the box of truth. So 
this game it's it's really quick okay so I'll, let me let me explain how it works i'm gonna i'll say a word and the first thing that comes to your mind you you tell me and share that with everyone all right so very simple very simple simple right it's not something to take too long to think about so uh we'll start off with an example Are you ready all right so let's say i say all right, all right. I, thought, I, was, I was i was ready i was i didn't say yeah. <laughs> no no worries I'm like so. in anticipation so let, first word, as an example, so I say ministry, and what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Service. Service, okay. So that's exactly what I'll be doing. So I'll just, I'll say a few words, okay, and boom, you just throw them out there. Okay. All right, so leadership. Uh, wow, I don't know why this is so hard. Again, <laughs> ministry, leadership, service. Service, okay. Um, calling. Important. Um, future. Scary. Uh, 2020. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. There you go. So that, that's really what it is right there. And I, I, I love that dear Lord. Cause that, that's really, I think how 2020 has gone. It's, it's really like you were saying the new, the new decade has been a mix of, of everything, of yeah. everything. Um, awesome. Awesome. So now coming to the next segment. Brother Georgian, what are what are some books that you could recommend to our listeners that has impacted your life and you know would be a huge blessing to anyone that would pick up that book? Um, okay, a few books. I have three mm -hmm. that I would suggest like right off the bat. Um, one is going to be The Celebration of Discipline by Richard J. Foster. Celebration of Discipline is a great inward look at our lives and how discipline prepares us to serve God and our community of believers better. Um, now, it's not an apostolic perspective. So, again, read and spit out the bones. Uh, right. Read what's good and then you know, keep hold of your apostolic doctrine. Right, right. Um, but uh, he has some really good – he goes in there and talking about how it's the private disciplines and how they interact with the public disciplines. That's a fantastic book. Uh, helped me a lot understand the value of both because, you know, a lot of church culture today is based on public disciplines where we, we come together and it's traditional like worship settings and, and church, but we lack in the uh, personal disciplines and individual disciplines, um, which you have to have both in order to grow both of those areas effectively. And that's a great book for that. Um, the second book, well, this is a classic. And it was one I was uh, to read. If you are interested in living for God and doing something for God, you need to read the making of a man of God by Alan Redpath. Mm. Um, mostly because literally every chapter has like 60 sermons in it. Um, or it's just so many inspirational points. He does such a good job at like looking at every segment of David's life and pulling out these great illustrations, showing us this is why he was a man after God's own heart, you know, and that's for anybody. If you're really looking to be, the person God wants you to be read making of a man, a God by Alan Redpath. Um, third book that I really have enjoyed. And again, he paints with broad strokes, but I believe it's um, his last name is Th Gary Thomas wrote a book called sacred pathways and sacred pathways. You know, culture we're really obsessed uh, and part of it's good. Part of it's bad. I think we, we really like this whole like Myers-Briggs uh, Enneagram uh, personality test things. And it's part of it's good. It helps you understand your natural tendencies, uh, but it does have some dangers. And he kind of deals with that in this book. And what I like about this book is he will deal with um, your natural tendencies. So he kind of goes through the whole Myers-Briggs personality type thing, but then he starts talking about spiritual personality types and he, he obviously painting with very broad strokes he's kind of, he nails down about nine different categories of how people experience God. And he proves the fact that just because you have a natural tendency. So like, I'm just for quick reference, cause I know we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to move for quick reference. Like I'm an ENFP, which means I'm kind of the enthusiast. I, I like to have fun. I'm always up for an adventure, very spontaneous um, and very excited. I'm very easily excitable. Um, I get super pumped for just really random things. It could literally like I bought a barrel the other like an old wooden nail barrel, and I can't tell you how excited I got about buying it, <laughs> which would be like the dumbest thing. And it's right back here. I think you can see it, but like that barrel, oh, yes, like yes. I got so excited about my barrel, uh, which is so dumb. But you would think because of that that spiritually that the way I he's talking about how do you experience God? How are you inspired and led by God the most when you're in His presence? And 
you would say like most Christians, like there's the enthusiasts or the naturalists, people who experience you know, God in nature, and they, that's where they feel like they're closest to God. People who experience God, uh, the the natural, or no, 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 like the enthusiast, the one who, like in a, in a high energy service or a high energy something like you would expect. And then you have like the intellectuals who only only feel like they really get close to God whenever they're studying. Or there's he paints the broad strokes. You read the book. right, but um. Naturally, I would think, oh, I'm the enthusiast, right? So I'm probably a naturalist where I experience God in nature. And then I like, oh, I'll turn around and like, no, I experience God in my enthusiasm because ooh, ooh, we're going, we're moving. But I found that he has these little tests in the book. And it's true. If you really talk about the nature of humanity, the nature of God, and the uh, juxtaposition of both, I actually found that through reading the book, I learn more about God and i closer to God as an intellectual, as someone, when I study his word and get really close to it, that's where I actually personally feel closer to God, which is so different from my nature. Mm -hmm. Nature is to avoid sitting down for too long in one place and uh, being confined to a space in uh, like, I'm uh, like to, to read and really just study is not in my natural personality type, but how natural is that of human beings? To get close to God, you have to deny your flesh. So right. I think in this culture right now where we're all trying to figure out ourselves and we're all really trying to figure out our personality types, there's this great book out here saying, like, look, just because you're an INTJ or just because you're an ENFJ or ENFP does not necessarily mean that's how you need to get as close to God as you can because we'll use that as a crutch a lot of times. And uh, he's saying, like, no, nah, like, you, that's not the way you probably usually get close to God. Sometimes it takes right. a little denial of your flesh. So it's a great book. Sorry, I know I went long on that last. No, time. no, that's great. This is this is listen. This is great info for everyone that's going to be listening. Great, great info, and and for everyone listening, I'm gonna I'm gonna put those books and the authors in the description box on our YouTube channel, on the podcast channel, so that way. Uh, Brother Georgian, they're going to be able to check it out and read it. And hopefully they do. Hopefully they, they get these books. Um, I'm going to check them out because I, I want to continue to add to my library. I'm personally not a natural reader uh, myself. You and I were, were talking about this uh, the other time. I, I'm so thankful uh, to my wife. I told Brother Blake the other day, you know, I'm so thankful because really she, she's helped me develop that skill to to just continue to learn and, and um and reading books, well, what's, what's that cliche that people say? Leaders are readers, right? Yeah, so leaders. growing your knowledge is so important, getting prepared. So um, yeah, with time, I just, now I love to read. I love to read. So right now I'm reading, like I was mentioning, Extreme Ownership by Jock Willink. And then I'm reading a book by James Sire, uh, Discipleship of the Mind. So Oh, I heard of that one, yeah. Yeah, so so two good books, reading both at the same time now. Um, but yeah, I'll put that in the description box. And Brother Judah, I know, so now this is really uh, the last segment of the show. Where could people where could people follow you, right? For them to continue to see God be glorified in your life, to see you continue to grow. Where could people find you? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm on all the normal, I'm on, the, I think that, I think they're the normal channels. Uh, the social <laughs> I, I, I'm so, I'm not. Uh, until a new one's made, right? There's like so many different stuff coming out. new one that I haven't heard of. I, I'm on Facebook, Georgian Pedigo. Um, uh, Instagram, you can look at, uh, I guess if you wanted to follow, uh, I, I'm not, I'm probably not the most inspirational poster. I'm not very good at social media. I hardly ever post. I like to, you know, but uh, I, I, I probably, but if you want to jump on there, I think it's at George underscore on slash off. And the reason for that is because uh, the best way I explain people how to spell my name is it's like George with an O in at the end. So it's like a light switch. It's George on, George off. Yes. George on yeah. and George off. So yeah, George on, George off on Instagram. Uh, I won't direct you to Twitter because I never get on Twitter. I, I, don't do it. <laughs> I have one, but I literally don't do anything on Twitter. So Facebook and Instagram, and then I'm starting a YouTube channel. Uh, so it's George and Pedigo on YouTube. And I'm doing this, uh, a little bit of tourism around the Northeast. It's kind of these little six to seven minute uh, inspirational tourism. I mean, they, they maybe they're not inspirational, but um, I, they can be, I'll let you guys decide. You guys can leave a comment for me in the box with what you think. But uh, I'm on YouTube as well as George and Pedigo. So. Yes, and I, I recommend everyone check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, some of the different shots he gets of of the views that you go check out. It's pretty pretty cool. And I think did you tell me you, you your drone got messed up recently for oh, the, for yeah. those videos? 
I crashed my drone. I literally had it for like a couple weeks and uh, I got way too ambitious. Um, you <laughs> live happened? and learn, right? You live and you learn. I, I was out shooting a dinosaur park where they think they found some, uh, uh, dinosaur footprints or whatever. And there was this really cool drain pipe that ran under the highway. I was like, Oh, that'd be a really cool shot to have it coming out of the drain pipe into the forest and all that type of stuff. It's going to be a great shot. Right. Little did I know that like, you gotta, you gotta be a pretty good pilot to fly an aircraft through a pipe. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, like, right. And I'm like, Oh, this is easy. And then like the drone was like, no, this was really dumb. Uh, yeah. So, here I am, I'm like running around the forest trying to find something to stand on. I'm climbing inside a drain pipe that's leaking water right under the highway. I can hear cars like coming over the drain pipe above me. And I'm literally in the middle of this drain pipe, like reaching down, trying to get a drone and climb back out. Oh, gosh. No, I just no. I back in the mail I, the other day. So. Well, I, I, I asked because I think people need to know that it's not easy filming. It's just not easy. Uh, yeah. All the work that you have to do and all YouTubers in general. Listen, I admire the hard work you have to put into because it, it's not easy. All the creativity, the different shots you have to do to make it look appealing to the consumer, to the people that are watching. So that's why I asked because I want people that are listening like, look, he works hard for this stuff. You guys got to check it out. And plus, this is the, the cool thing. Uh, I, I'm born and raised in Connecticut. My family's from Columbia. Some of the places you've been to, Brother Jordan, I, I have never heard of. And now it's like, I have to go check them out now. Like, oh, I have cool. to go add it to my list. So so I think for a lot of people that are going to be uh, checking it out, they're going to be like, hey, you know what? If I ever pop over to the Northeast, these are small details. I got to go check off on my bucket list. Well, good. That's the goal. I hope. Uh, look, there's inspiration everywhere. Uh, yes. If you're willing to see it, God can use anything. Uh, that's what I believe is God can use absolutely anything to inspire you. So, man, uh, that's the goal. Just you get out there, even though it may not be on the normal tourist map. It may just be a little thing in your neighborhood. You know, the more I travel, the more I evangelize out. I'm going to try to cover more sites, even in different states and all that type of stuff. That's you awesome. Get, you get across the point is like God can literally use anything to speak. Um you know, and there'll be fun episodes. There'll be more serious little things going on, you know, but yeah, most of it is like you can literally be inspired by anything. Yes. That's kind of the whole goal. No, and I, and, and my last point on this is for me personally, like when I want to take some vacation, not, not these days, right? Like I took some days off this week, but, uh, you know, when I actually want to take some good vacation time to go out and explore, I usually have to hop on on Google and just kind of, you know, what are some things to check out? And and I don't spend too much time into it. I kind of just go with a few. So I think what's really cool about your channel is it really gives a great outlook to other people of really places that may not pop up on the first page of Google, right? So that's also another huge plus to why everyone that's listening, you got to watch this. Uh, you got to check it out. Everyone that's going to check out our YouTube channel and and. I'm going to put the link to Brother Georgian's uh, YouTube channel on, on our description box. So, Brother Georgian, I will uh, I will place it on our podcast show as well in that description. That way people can just come check it out because I think they should and and I think it's awesome. So, and I, I listen, we got we got to see you get another drone because those were some really cool shots you were getting last oh, time. Oh, man. Well, it just came back in the mail. I had to send it off. Uh, oh, you I got it back. Yeah, I'm the weird dude. Do you name your pieces of technology? Because every piece of technology I have, I name. Like my car, I have named. I name most of my cameras. Uh, so <laughs> I name. I name my drone Archimedes. Archimedes just got back in the mail the other day. Archimedes. So, yes, so. I love it. I love it, man. That's awesome. Well, I should have named him. Uh, what's that guy who fell out of the sky? I should have named him that. Uh, but uh, it was. <laughs> No, this is great, man. This is great. I, I appreciate it so much. It's been awesome having you on the show. Uh, Brother Georgian Pettigo, thank you so much. We got to have you come back in the future. It's been such a blessing to have you. And I know that so many other people that are going to be listening and watching um, are going to be blessed by this as well. So, Brother Georgian Pettigo, God bless you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Love y'all. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching the show today. If you enjoyed it, make sure to follow us and subscribe so you can stay up to date with the newest episodes and follow us on all social media platforms. So check out the links below.